teraz. Cześć Karolina. Nie słyszę Cię, masz, jesteś zmutowana. Tak, możesz teraz wyłączyć nagrywanie i włączymy je tu z, z powrotem tu. And I'm trying to connect with Facebook right now. Correct. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. I think we should slowly start. There are still colleagues joining us. So, uh, dear all, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you on the occasion of the third webinar within the series Migration and Cities, Managing the Crisis. And today we are going to focus on the forced migration, relocation and housing. Obviously the context of, uh, of this seminar and our series is the current humanitarian crisis in Ukraine and the refugee crisis uh, in Poland. This event is organized not only by two research units from the Center of Migration Research of the University of Warsaw, but we have two new uh, partners. So it's my pleasure to welcome the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland and the Union of Polish Metropolises. The meeting, just for your information, is recorded and the recording will be made available after the event on the Center of Migration Research channel on YouTube. The event is divided as our previous events into two main parts. So firstly, we will ask our dear guests to contribute with short speeches uh, in the field of, uh, of the expertise and in the field of the topic of this meeting. And this part will take more or less one hour, uh, 15 minutes. And then we will, we will have up to half an hour for our discussion. And during this uh, Q&A section, you will be invited to uh, ask the questions to our guests. Uh, and we ask you to do this with the use of chat on Zoom or um, on our streaming on Facebook. So now I would like to very briefly introduce uh, the representatives of our uh, partners. So firstly, I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Matthias Detling from the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland, that is a deputy head of mission of this embassy. Matthias, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Marta. And on behalf of the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland, it is my great pleasure to um, also extend our warm welcome to uh, everyone. We are uh, very pleased 
to partner with the Center of Migration Research of the University of Warsaw on this uh, webinar uh, entitled Forced Migration, Relocation and Housing, a topic which is, of course, as was mentioned by Marta, set within the current context of the humanitarian crisis in uh, Ukraine. And we are especially delighted that um, Ms. Tila Jakovic, who is the head of the asylum department uh, of the Swiss canton of St. Gallen, is here with us today um, as one of our panelists. Uh, and she will speak about how her canton, which is located in the eastern part of Switzerland, is handling the situation in terms um, of housing of forced migrants from uh, Ukraine. And uh, she will also shed some light on how she, at the cantonal level, uh, works together with the central government, uh, as well as with the municipalities in her canton, in terms of uh, relocation and housing. Um, this state structure in Switzerland, you know, with its three levels, combined with the principle of subsidiarity, um, where the central government may only take up a task if the cantons are unable to fulfill this task or if um, overarching regulation is needed. This sort of very unique uh, feature of Switzerland will surely be reflected um, in uh, her presentation and, and how we in Switzerland deal with um, these issues. Um, let me perhaps just highlight a few facts. Um, so we have uh, currently more than 40,000 uh, forced migrants from uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's currently about seven to 800 who uh, apply for protection status every day. And uh, they live in reception centers uh, or in other accommodation, but also with host families, uh, so there's really also been a, a, a great deal of solidarity uh, with um, forced migrants from Ukraine from day one in Switzerland. Uh, and whereas, of course, the numbers are in no way comparable to the numbers um, here in Poland, where the solidarity and the hospitality have really been uh, beyond impressive. It is nevertheless uh, an exceptional circumstance in Switzerland to the extent that we never had to set up such a complex system for so many forced migrants in such a short time. Um, Switzerland uh, is also providing humanitarian aid uh, for Ukraine. Um, just to mention that as well, at, at the Stand Up for Ukraine campaign, uh, our president um, a few weeks ago pledged, pledged a support package of uh, 80 million uh, Swiss francs, uh, which comprises uh, financial contributions, uh, aid supplies, but also personnel such as specialists uh, in the areas of emergency shelter, water, sanitation, hygiene and health and medicine. So this just as a matter uh, of a very general introduction. We will hear more from uh, Ms. Tila Jakomet uh, in a moment about the handling, the opportunities and challenges regarding the spatial policies for forced migrants from Ukraine within the context of her canton, St. Gallen. So without much further ado, I would like to hand back to um, Marta and, and Karina. And again, thank you so much for including us in this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for this very brief introduction. That's uh, really a pleasure to working with you. And just to let you know, we will announce also at the end of this meeting, there will be three other meetings devoted to different sections of uh, reception and integration related topics with the involvement of our colleagues from Switzerland. So now I would like to give the floor to other um, colleague of mine and of CMR from the Union of uh, Polish Metropolises, Magdalena Wojno, but unfortunately, due to some meetings that are going on in the city, uh, she is not with us at the moment. Maybe she will join later. So maybe I will very briefly announce that uh, Center of Migration Research has just launched the official cooperation with uh, this body, Union of Polish Metropolises. This is the association of 12 uh, big or be the biggest cities uh, in Poland, and we will be working together on different migration related issues. So now after this short uh, introductory part, I will just give the floor to uh, Karolina Łukasiewicz, 
from Center of Migration Research that was NIS co-organizer of this uh, CMR series uh, of, uh, of events. So Carolina, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Marta. Again, um, I'm very grateful for our speakers uh, to be here. Um, welcome to our third CMR uh, webinar. Uh, we have some, uh, more scheduled. Uh, and now I'll just take briefly where, 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 what is the situation. So since the Russian, Russian invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, over 5.3 billion uh, million uh, people um, fled the war uh, and um, crossed, uh, crossed the uh, Ukrainian borders. Uh, and um, this is probably um, the largest migration in, the, in its scale and pace since the World War II. And uh, right now, almost three million people crossed Polish uh, cross Polish border. Um, it is estimated that between 1.4 up to 1.7 million already stayed in Poland. Um, almost half of that number are children. And um, within over two months, Polish population grew from less than 38 million to uh, almost 41 or estimated uh, 41.5 million. This is really unprecedented uh, scale. And the vast majority of forced migrants uh, from Ukraine are actually uh, settling in Polish cities and the population of Polish cities rapidly grew. Some cities such as uh, Rzeszu, for instance, uh, increased by 45%. Um, and among different challenges that Polish cities are now facing, providing housing for the uh, estimated 1.5 million people is the most pressing, uh, pressing need. And so we gathered here great uh, Polish and international speakers to discuss the challenges and also um, best practices in terms of addressing housing uh, for refugees. And so uh, we have uh, uh, we have two speakers uh, from Poland, uh, Krzysztof Stanowski, the director of the Center of International Cooperation of the City of Lublin, uh, and also Tomasz Patswa, the director of the Office of Assistance and Social Projects of the City of Warsaw. Um, and uh, and after uh, um, after they present the current uh, situation and challenges in Poland, we will listen to Jennifer Watts the chief executive officer from the uh, Immigrant Services uh, Association of Nova Scotia in Canada, uh, Tilia Jakomet, the head of the asylum department of the canton of St. Gallen in Switzerland, and uh, Eli Auslander from the University of York, who will present uh, the, uh, the, the best practices from, uh, from Germany. Uh, so uh, I think... Uh, uh, is Tomasz Pastwa here already? I'm just. I just got the confirmation that uh, he will be late because he's also he will he's just after the meeting, but he will join us later. So we have to make a, a small change in our schedule. Okay, so we can we can in that case we can start with uh, Krzysztof uh, uh, Krzysztof Stanowski. Um, uh, okay, do, uh, do you want to start? And we, we would love to hear what is the current situation in L Lublin, um, how many refugees crossed the city and um, how many registered and are living here right now and what are the major challenges that Lublin is currently uh, currently facing and how do you, regarding housing and how, you, how do you yeah. plan to address those challenges moving forward? Welcome from Lublin. As you understand, Lublin is the city is in Eastern Poland. Will I be allowed to share the presentation? Uh, if technically possible, I will be happy. In Lublin, uh, for now, we have around 40,000 refugees from Ukraine. For the city of 340,000 inhabitants, uh, it's, it's quite substantial number. And I would like to share the experience what happened from this from these first days, especially when we are talking something what we call accommodation, accommodation point. Uh, in uh, Lublin, we established the Civic Committee of Solidarity of Support Ukraine five hours after first bombing. Five hours after, after first bombings, 
some people from NGOs and uh, local government created responsible team, uh, response team, which immediately organized all the support to refugees in, in, in Lublin. This is very important that we are together talking about people from the local government and mainly the NGOs and then many other NGOs were formed. If I will say that before the end of the first day, we had the hotline, uh, information line in three languages, which by government was, was given as the only in some stage official uh, hotline, it will say how we are organized. The first three issues which we are dealing with, uh, it was first of all uh, information, uh, direct hotline in three languages in the first day, now in five languages with up to uh, 12 people serving at the same moment, uh, at the same moment uh, to the uh, to, to, to all those who are arriving and need information. The second element was to organize volunteers, to bring them together. The third element is to organize uh, the, 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 the housing, organize uh, the, uh, the accommodation for, uh, for the people. This is very important to understand that in this crisis, we are talking about two forms of accommodation. The one form is housing organized on behalf of state by the local government. In opposite to Switzerland, this is the responsibility of the national govern government, which is not doing so much, even not financing uh, that seriously. Uh, and uh, in practice, the responsibility to host uh, new uh, inhabitants is on the side of the local government. And this mass, uh, we can say, or not so mass uh, accommodation is mainly organized in dormitories, in sports centers, uh, in these areas. As Lublin is academic city, there are quite a lot of uh, such places, the mayor announced once a week before uh, the, uh, the direct attack that we are prepared for 15,000 uh, refugees to post them. Uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, these 14,000 refugees, high majority of them stay in private homes of inhabitants. Uh, only a few thousand, uh, the, the, the lar largest number was 3,000, are using these uh, facilities we prepared as a city, at the same moment, civic committee, um, which is organizing this accommodation for yeah, for people. The, the, the main problem we faced on the very early stage was that uh, it was a database of the, uh, of the apartments, of the uh, rooms, of the, uh, of the flats in some cases, but unfortunately it was technically difficult uh, to to communicate people and people, uh, uh, Ukrainians, were quite easily were moving. So we were trying to arrange them by the phone and it, it wasn't working. People were moving around the city, move, moving around the country. So we found the solution that we establish the place where we bring together, where we bring uh, refugees and with them we try to solve, to find the accommodation, the accommodation for them. It was waiting room, um, uh, five, seven stands uh, where our teams were, 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 were assisting them. And it was this, this point uh, was open daily from 10 a.m. to 
to 6 p.m. with with two shifts. We should understand that in Lublin we have 460 interpreters, volunteers speaking uh, Ukrainian, and a few thousand other 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 volunteers. And we we succeed uh, for free to 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 accommodate uh, more today more than one thousand. Uh, 500 people. The important element is that originally we had a lot of uh, offers of the uh, housing, of the flats. Today the, the city is full and the number of, uh, of free houses is, uh, is very, very Alicia Szczutowska, could you please uh, unmute yourself? Thank you. Mute yourself. Thank mm -hmm. you. That means that majority of those 40,000, 30, 40,000 inhabitants are uh, accommodated in rather private places that in mass accommodation. Uh, we as a city and we as a civic committee uh, assist uh, those who, uh, who accept new guests with food, uh, with other services. We also provide cash support programs for the, uh, for the uh, refugees. Uh, as a first in Poland, we employed uh, uh, 50 teachers from Ukraine to in, 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 in schools in, in Lublin in cash for work uh, format. And in this way, we try to give them and we also uh, support them in getting, uh, getting the, the jobs. The resort centers near Lublin, like Kazimierz, like Nawentu, this is the area where part of the, the business, especially, is supporting part of those who are uh, who are staying in in Lublin. the another direction to to deal uh, with those who arrived in Poland was thinking about relocation first of all we should say that relocation is not uh, internal relocation within Poland is not allowed by the government that means we cannot legally negotiate between the communities to transfer any group of uh, refugees to Szczecin to, to move them to West. Uh, we are really overcrowded. We are city relatively close, uh, close to the border. Um, it's not legal, it's big issue, and it's not done by the, by the, by the, by the national government, and it's the only opportunity. Then we started to talk. We should, we should also remember that we have uh, quite big groups of, of refugees with special needs. Lublin is a target country, a target city for the deaf Ukrainians, for those who have the very good school and, and dormitory. Uh, in this school for deaf students, we used to have four Ukrainian classrooms classes before the war. So it's doubled. A lot of uh, families are in the dormitories with, the, with their children, with the students, four and a half thousand students, which are university students, which are studying in, in, in Lublin. The next option, of course, was international relocation. And we started to do that with our uh, partner cities. Uh, we, we our partner cities is Nancy, is Minster, and relatively easy. Uh, we got the uh, offers to uh, to relocate uh, people, and saying frankly, this is not very successful exercise. On one side, the the western cities, the cities from the Western Europe, uh, Nancy. Uh, Minister, we got also some offers from other countries. Uh, they they passed the message we are ready to, to accept refugees. On 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 other hand, uh, we 
we we we as an international cooperation center took responsibility for 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 that you know, working with the former policeman who is working in the in the city hall and we decided that we will allow to go to relocation abroad only with improved partners that means we do not give people that someone will pick them up and we're asking very specific questions which are which were important for 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 refugees uh, it was about transport about it was about documents it was about pets it was about uh, testing for covid-19 and so on uh, the question we never expected which seems to be extremely important for refugees from ukraine was will they pay for the return trip if we can go back without that people were not interested, interested uh, to go it was extremely important that we are organizing the meetings with the officials arriving here to ask all the questions to discuss the situation to, to see who is inviting them physically and we successfully uh, moved people to, to France, uh, to France mainly, to, uh, we are working on Minister Germany and next transportation to, to France. First, we have to say there is no huge intention to go west when we are talking refugees who I meet in extreme situation, that means uh, people wounded or orphanages, this is a separate story, we also hospitals, we also do that, uh, but this is this is another story. Uh, the second, uh, it's difficult to say, but we found that countries with traditionally used to uh, support refugees are not selected, are not first choice for Ukrainians. Uh, Norway, no. Um, Germany. No, we were surprised to see that the uh, French offer or offer of the French cities was much most favorable by the Ukrainians. The traditional systems which offered next two weeks in the sport hall or the refugee center were not welcomed by our Ukrainian colleagues who in general prefer to stay in Poland uh, than to go abroad. The Canada is not a very kind offer from Canada, perfect offer from Canada. It's too far, uh, very well organized. Uh, and, uh, and objectively, I know that this Canadian offer is absolutely the perfect one, but there is no intention to go as long as do not have has families or relatives or something like that. Very well organized is Portugal offer. And we have people who are coming back in these countries. Uh, there are few people in the three countries. Some of them decide to go back. Some people go back from Poland to Ukraine. So when we are talking about relocation, first of all, there is no mass intention of relocation. We are overloaded it with the offers. Challenge. We have real challenges dealing with trafficking, dealing with crime. We have to be sure uh, when we as a city offer something that it's definitely safe. And, uh, and, and finally, we should be, and, and you understand, we're not talking about Ukrainians, we are talking also about trauma, others being refugees from, uh, from Ukraine, all that, we treat them equally, all that required special understanding, special treatment, and especially most challenging group is a group of wounded people, of people injured, of people who need uh, assistance. Recently, we did, especially in one dormitory, 
we, we, we created a special place section where we provide nursery medical assistance for people who are leaving hospitals. That means those people who, who left hospitals, who need assistance, who can leave hospital, who do not need direct treatment in hospital, but but they need assistance. And this is this is very important. Our our way to keep people uh, safe in the city is to provide food, to provide assistance uh, uh, to those hosts who are uh, welcoming in high majority for free. Unfortunately, it requires money. Uh, and anyway, uh, we will not have enough uh, space to host them all the time in next few years. The last comment about Lublin, you understand uh, a year ago, we won for the next year, the title for Lublin of European Youth, Council, Youth Capital. We will be European Youth Capital next year. With all these new inhabitants, today we are 20 years younger than we used to be two months ago. Uh, suddenly, we have a lot of children, we need a lot of kindergartens, we have a lot of new students, and this is this hard is to, to job the first need. Mm. And saying frankly, if something will, will went wrong, we are prepared for 10 times more than we have today. And this is the reality. We know how we will host um, 100,000 people if we will be in need. is less luxury um, format than it's... Uh, now it's anyway basic, but, 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 but we keep some... We will be happy to answer any question once again. The Lublin is a city where local government together with the uh, NGOs, uh, together with volunteers and together with business, relatively successfully uh, welcomed 40,000 of uh, refugees and same amount as Switzerland. Uh, and uh, unfortunately we are alone. That means we are without the state and this is the big challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This was really uh, interesting and insightful. Lublin is indeed uh, um, an another very interesting example of what is uh, what kind of challenges um, our Polish city is facing. Um, With your inspiration. And also inspiration, yes. Like just think about it in a city with a population of over 342,000. Uh, there is now almost 70,000 Ukrainians. That's that's really an unprecedented challenge. Um, we are still we are still waiting for um, to be joined by Tomasz Paspa from the um, from the city of Warsaw. Uh, but uh, maybe meanwhile we can now uh, switch to. Uh, to the international examples and learn how uh, other countries more experienced uh, than Poland uh, are, are dealing with uh, hosting refugees and we're especially interested in the more systematic solutions that as you can see in Poland right now everything is happening uh, kind of ad hoc and uh, spontaneously. Uh, so let's learn from other examples. Uh, I would like to invite now uh, Jennifer Watts, Chief Executive Officer of Immigrant Service Association of uh, Nova Scotia. Can you tell us a few words about your organization? What kind of services do you offer to migrants and how is your organization addressing the housing uh, of, of migrants arriving uh, in Canada and also what works best in, in terms of housing practices? Is there anything we could learn from from the more more experienced uh, examples. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and good morning from Canada. Uh, as a start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded uh, traditional Mi'kmaq territory. 
I'm grateful for the peace and friendship treaties that exist between the indigenous people of this land and settler communities. At ISIS, as we work to settle immigrants in Nova Scotia, we honor and respect the indigenous people of this land and recognize our responsibility to respond to the calls of action put forward through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's a very important starting point for us. Whose land is it? Who are we settling? What is our responsibility for doing this? I'd also like to thank you again for the invitation to speak and for that very inspiring message from Lublin. I must say it, it brought tears to my eyes to hear what you folks are doing in terms of responding. There are no, we're all experts here. We are all dealing with situations that evolve and rapidly change. And so, uh, although some of us may have had more experience in terms of long-term uh, settlement of, uh, of uh, refugees, um, we all come to this table with a lot of uh, experience and, and knowledge, so thank you. And I'd like to recognize the tremendous efforts that you're doing in response to this brutal war and uh, know that you are your compassion and commitment is understood and we're sending you strength and we're sending you very best wishes for this work that you are undertaking and that we see you as very valuable partners in this process. ISIS has the 40 years experience in, the, uh, in Nova Scotia of being involved in resettlement uh, uh, programs. We are a full service agency, which is different than some agencies across Canada. There are many of us that uh, work in this area across Canada, but we offer resettlement services. So uh, uh, government assisted refugees that come to us, we provide full uh, program support for a year and, and beyond in terms of work. Uh, we offer have a very extensive language school program. We all have a strong employment team that works at connecting employers and uh, and immigrants. We have a community integration team that works a lot around integrating and connecting Canadians born here with with new arrivals. And we have a business development team and we do a lot of work with employers. So we have a very full service delivery. We have a staff of about 300 that works uh, in terms of uh, ongoing uh, support for immigrants and refugees. Um, what I'd like to say about this particular situation, so in the context of where we're working right now, we've seen increasing numbers at the last national level for refugees generally coming into the country. Last year, Canada embarked on a very specific program to support as well uh, uh, Afghan uh, refugees arriving, so the government has made a very strong commitment to that. And now we have the situation with the unfortunate war and the impact uh, of, uh, of Ukrainians leaving and the huge uh, humanitarian response that we're called to be engaged with. It's important to note in this particular situation, Canada does not recognize the Ukrainians as refugees. Uh, it has to do that there's a durable situation right now in Europe, so it doesn't trigger our regular program in terms of how we offer program services. Uh, Ukrainians who come here have a special visa. It's an open work permit. It's very easy to access. Um, it, is, uh, it is unusual and different for, for us. It was similar to when the Kosovo uh, migration was happening in the 1990s, but it is a different situation for us. So this is a new learning experience for us as well, because it doesn't trigger the regular processes that we normally would have to respond to the situation. So in response, um, we've been working with our federal partners and with our provincial partners and settlement agencies across the country to figure out how can we respond to the situation. And we have established uh, in a partnership with uh, the Federal Department uh, of uh, Immigration and our settlement community, an operation safe haven for Ukraine. So that's pulling together, coordinating resources, uh, trying to manage. There are many things that I can talk about, but I wouldn't, but just saying that national structure has been put in place, funded and supported by our federal government. And our prime minister has been actively engaged in kind of leading and promoting this. Uh, and our provincial governments that have a lot of power in Canada are now trying to figure out their role. And one of the big differences uh, probably with the, the delivery of this program to Ukrainians is that they don't qualify for the uh, income assistance and, uh, and housing support that normally refugees would have coming through our regular system. So this is a new territory for us. We're trying to scramble. Each provision, uh, not, I shouldn't say scramble, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's being done well, it's being moving forward, but it is something that is, is different for us. Uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of interest on the part of local communities and our provincial governments to say, how can we respond? 
but it's taking um, time to understand where is the federal government going to step in and take action, and they are, but it is a big, you know, machine to move forward in terms of getting things uh, uh, established, and then how the provincial governments who can be more nimble in responding uh, come forward and, fit and, and uh, fill the gaps. Our provincial government in Nova Scotia, like many provincial governments, has been very responsive. And so as the federal government has been adapting and changing, and it's a very evolving and fluid, every week we hear of new announcements about you are now going to do this program. For example, last week or the week before, they said every Ukrainian arrival, arriving will have a two-week hotel voucher and six weeks of income assistance. So that was helpful for us to know. So then the provincial government knows they don't have to do that immediate response, but look at some of the more... Uh, uh, a, a medium term and long term uh, response for that. But again, I think one of our uh, big challenges is communication and understanding from the federal level, from the provincial level, and then at the local community level, what is happening. So we're spending a lot of time that, um, uh, looking at good, strong communication uh, uh, systems to put in place. Most of the Ukrainians arriving right now in Canada are coming because they have a connection. So they're not necessarily actually looking for a house or a place to stay immediately because they have someone, a family member or a friend to come with. We are now beginning to see people arriving that don't have those connections but their numbers aren't, aren't necessarily huge, but that's the next wave that we need to be thinking about and preparing for. Um, I'd like to talk one of the important things because in some ways this is, it's a short-term crisis, but it is a long-term program around housing for refugees. And, and so one of the things that we really try and ground ourselves in as a settlement agency is what is our approach? It is about empowerment. It is using an adult education model. It is saying people are coming with their own resources and respecting that. So wherever we can, we don't want to be doers. We want to be people who are accompanying people on making their decisions. And I think I hear that in Lublin where people are saying, we don't necessarily want to do this. This is what we want to do. And that is super, super important to recognize that. We use a trauma-informed lens. So we train our staff around trauma uh, and, and do a lot of intentional work around that because people are coming with significant trauma. We use an EDI, an equity, diversity, inclusion lens. So making sure that we are treating everyone who comes to our door with equal opportunity and, and also using an equity lens around that. We know we're not, you know, speaking from a settlement agent perspective, we're not perfect. We have a lot to learn. In times of crisis, we want to be responding rapidly. But we also, one of the things I feel is very important is we stand back and ground ourselves in our values. There is a crisis, but the best and most important way we can respond is when we're grounded in our values of understanding what it is, what's our mission, what is our work, and how we're going to, to engage with people around that. Um, in terms of, the, uh, of this longer term strategy, because it will be important uh, to look at, we do a lot of work around uh, uh, understanding uh, how to engage the local community in this. So we have uh, a lot of anti-racism work, cultural awareness work. We have a welcome ambassador program because it's going to be important that people are integrated and supported and have community support. There's a lot of goodwill, but there are also a lot of pressures. And affordable housing in Canada is at a crisis situation. In the city that I live in, Halifax, we have the lowest vacancy rate in the whole country. There's not a lot of housing. We all also engage with our other community housing partners who are doing affordable housing for people who are homeless or particular populations, vulnerable populations, because we know this is not, a, we're, this is not outside. We don't want to be a special uh, uh, needs or groups are seen at this. We're all working to develop long-term affordable housing issues. And we know that although uh, immigrants uh, bring, as well as many people, additional pressure to the housing market, they are also critically part of the solution in terms of their labor skills and, and, and commitments, which we have a great deal of shortage for. We also spend a lot of time building relationships with landlords. So we've been doing this over the long term, but we work with private developers. We work, many of whom are immigrants themselves, but we work to make sure that they understand what our needs are. They are very responsive in terms of hosting lunch and learns with their community to help see where we can uh, develop relationships with landlords. We have staff that work with landlords 
is to make sure the transition of placement of refugees is supported. So around making sure that we provide interpretation services, uh, that we problem solve, that we're working consistently because we really feel that personal relationship is key and that develops over the long term. And as a result, we've seen where landlords have said, we will offer uh, discounts on first month's rent. We will offer uh, uh, supportive programs, rooms where you can have community uh, meetings in. Uh, and also uh, let go of credit checks because we know there's an organization behind this group. So that relationship has been very important. Like many of you is, are describing, we have or, or have described as the uh, welcome host of temporary uh, accommodations. So again, through uh, relationships with landlords, we rent block units for years, you know, several years now where people come, they transition through for the first two to three weeks. Now, because of the housing situation is extended probably five, six or seven weeks in the temporary housing before they move into permanent housing. Uh, again, that's, and also work with supportive hotel operators in that, uh, in, in, in um, renting uh, floors to be able to do this. And this funding um, has come uh, uh, from the federal government to support that. As I mentioned, it's not here now for the, uh, for the uh, Ukrainians, but we have a lot of private offers in terms of being able to support that as well. We have very dedicated staff and developing that personal relationship with landlords is key. We also need to know that because the situation will continue and in our response to humanitarian crises is that we need to really sharpen our skills as a staff team to be thinking outside of the box in terms of what is the next step for housing. And so inclusionary zoning at the municipal level where, you know, working with municipal authorities saying, you know, they will build in additional height for, for developers if they offer certain uh, rooms uh, to NGOs to be able to uh, house vulnerable populations. This is particularly important because many families that arrive have much larger groupings of children and we just don't have that configuration of rental accommodation. So getting, you know, units that have four to five bedrooms as opposed to the usual two to three. So thinking outside of the box, being ahead, developing those relationships and long-term strategies is important. We've been using Airbnb uh, in terms of them offering up free accommodation, particularly uh, during the Afghanistan uh, rivals, which has been very helpful. And again, the looking at the use of universities and centers for is kind of more short term accommodation, especially over the summer months. Um, for us, one of the challenges, and it's interesting, is moving people outside of the major urban centers into the rural or smaller smaller centers. Again, the housing market is not necessarily very um, better in those situations. But people tend to want to congregate in the larger urban centers. And we actually, frankly, have a hard time keeping people in Nova Scotia or the Atlantic region. Many people want to go to central Canada or the major bigger cities. And so we really work hard at uh, making that welcome, integrating people around employment, making those connections as soon as possible, because we want them to stay here. And, um, and the draw to the larger cities is, is, is a challenge for us. We also have been looking at the homestay program, and this is a very different and new thing for us because that has not been something that has been because the, the governments uh, have provided uh, opportunity around supporting people in settling. So that's a new area. Some major settlement agencies in Canada have embraced that and are kind of looking at how to manage and make sure that's a safe experience for, uh, for Ukrainians arriving. In Nova Scotia, we haven't gone to that step yet. We're waiting to see about the number of arrivals, whether that's an area that we would really need to work in. But again, there's a lot Lot of protocols and best practices that are being shared among the settlement communities about what would make sense to do. Um, we also have a private sponsorship uh, refugee program and the government is now beginning to, I think we'll be making some announcements over the next couple of weeks where uh, they support through training. You can go to the rstp.ca site in Canada, a very uh, is, uh, extensive program about supporting groups to sponsor private uh, refugee, refugees coming into the country. Uh, and also the government has set up a new, uh, we're waiting for further details and a special re reunification program for families. But again, there are a lot of issues about settling people. And so the training and resources that are provided through that program is very key to, to be able to, uh, to support people. 
So I think um, I, I will end into that. There's been many offers, you know, I think similar to Lublin, the local municipalities offer free bus passes, rec uh, access to recreation programs. We're getting free uh, cell phones from some of our private companies. There's just an outpouring of wanting to respond, which in some ways is, is, is difficult to manage uh, because you have so many things going on. And with this particular situation in Ukraine, we don't know when people are arriving. Normally, we would receive information beforehand from the IOM, we know who's coming, even with short notice, we'd be able to do this, but because of the way the visa is set up, it's almost um, a self-serve type of, of thing. You know, if someone has a visa in Poland, they may decide next week to come, or it could be in three weeks to come, and they arrive at a port of entry, and that's maybe where we first find out. But if they don't connect with the Red Cross at the port of entry, we may not know. So they're trying to resolve that situation. So it's something that is evolving and different for us, and, and we're trying to learn through that. So I'll, I'll close with just saying, Thank you for everything that you are doing. Um, really understand what a, a, an amazing effort you're making on this part. And uh, we are trying to do what we can do as best we can as well, and, and certainly look forward to from learning from your experience. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We will normally ask all the questions uh, uh, in the Q&A uh, after the speaker present, but I know that Jennifer has a very limited time, so we have actually one question uh, from the audience to you, so I will, uh, I will ask it uh, right away. Uh, so uh, Elizabeth, I'm guessing from Krakow, is asking, it's great to hear the focus on the, uh, on the lens of empowerment. A question on this topic, how are you utilizing Ukrainian immigrants um, organization and the extensive diaspora in Canada to provide targeted assistance to Ukrainian migrants? And how do you foster inclusion and decision-making process, particularly given the, the potential linguistic constraints and in, in most of the meetings uh, um, or organized uh, here in Krakow, I'm guessing, Ukrainians or other non-Poles are not included? Right, okay, so we work, uh, so both at the national level, provincial level and local level, we are working with the Ukrainian Congress of Canada, which uh, has been mobilizing unbelievably in response to this. We have the largest settlement of Ukrainian uh, 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 people in the world, I think outside of Russia after of Ukraine, this is prior to the uh, to the uh, war. So there's a significant population of Ukrainians here, but they're particularly settled in uh, Western Canada, which has been super active in accepting people. And so the majority of people we're seeing are going through Ontario and to Western Canada because of the family, family connections. So we're actively, we, for example, meet twice a week with uh, our provincial partners and the Ukrainian uh, Congress is on those phone calls. We're actively engaged with them in, uh, in understanding what they're seeing and understanding is coming in. On our staff, we have Ukrainians, so we also use that connection in terms of, of connecting, and uh, we are uh, uh, actively, you know, using interpretation services in terms of connecting. So, so far, as I've said, uh, it has been mostly people who have family connections who have arrived in Nova Scotia, so they've been able to um, manage in terms of, you know, the hotel and connecting into our services, but many of the people that we see now that are using our services is we want to find work because we want to be able to support our families uh, back in Ukraine. And again, we've had a lot of employers step up and amazingly saying we are ready to provide jobs. You know, and Canada has a national job board and specifically has set one up for access for, for Ukrainians to be able to, uh, to, to match and understand who are the employers in Canada right now looking for work and how people can and connect. So our employment team will be looking at that national list, looking with our local uh, employers, making those connections. So there's a lot of goodwill on the part of corporate uh, uh, bodies in Canada and the government to, to make sure that's connected and happening. I'm not sure if I captured all, there were several things in that question. I'm not sure if I missed something. Th th thank you very much. I think it answers the question. This is really impressive, the, the whole whole system and the holistic approach uh, that you're using. Uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, get, uh, get to the similar point uh, in Poland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. And now we can move to um, Tilia Jakumet from the, uh, from the uh, canton of St. Gallen. And uh, uh, 
Tilia, can you can you tell us um, can you tell us a few words about how housing is uh, organized for for refugees in um, in uh, in Swi Switzerland and in Saint Gallen specifically, and um, and what works best uh, in terms of addressing the housing needs? Is there anything you could recommend to do or not to do uh, in terms of organizing housing in Poland? Yeah, hello, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. I wouldn't dare to give you any recommendations <laughs> at all. We are such a small country and we have uh, about four to 3,000 Ukrainians in Switzerland. And, you know, I really can't give you any recommendations. At least uh, one week ago, I didn't even know that it could be interesting for anybody in the world how we organize us here in the canton of St. Gallen. Um, for me, it is important that I'm not speaking for whole Switzerland, which is not possible, at least not in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, as Matthias said it in his uh, introduction, um, small country and a very high autonomy of the local communities. So everybody is doing uh, things quite different. And uh, it's, 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 it's difficult to, to find like a main best practice, but I will talk mainly about um, my canton. I will try to show you my presentation. Oh, okay. So um, Eva, can you make Tilia co-host so that she could uh, sure. present? Should be working now. Okay. So what you see is the village of Kirchberg. I hope you see it. Is it okay? Are you? Is it right? No, we don't. It's we not? don't see it. Okay. Yet. Okay. Oh, now, now it's uh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. So this is what it looks like in my region. This is not a very small village. <laughs> it's not a town, but uh, this is about what it looks like in the eastern part of Switzerland. And this is actually the place where we have the main um, accommodation center for Ukraine refugees, and you. You, if you look at that uh, photograph, you don't, you, you wouldn't find the house which one it is because it is only for 200 people, and it is really integrated in the village. Um, maybe that's 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 special for us. Really, we 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 distribute all the Ukrainian refugees into the villages. So if you, for example, you are one of those local communities and you have this. Uh, um, uh, collective or bigger center, you are not in the duty anymore to take any other refugees, um, be it from the Ukraine or um, other countries. So it is like for Kirchberg, for this village, is probably quite nice to have a big house for the 200 people because that means they don't have to think about uh, work integration or school or anything else because it's all in that house where the people stay for like two or three days and then they move on to, to other villages. Just to give you a small idea of how it, what it looks like. Um, well, this is the numbers, you know, you all know, and uh, on the left, you see that we have 43,000 people from Ukraine. At the beginning, most of them came um, uh, uh, through um, relations, and now they are coming just uh, without any links to Switzerland. But probably that's not so exciting for you. Then what we did in the whole asylum system is uh, separate, uh, well, how can you say it? We have six big asylum regions instead of 26 cantons. That makes the communication a bit easier and um, it, it, it helps a lot in a crisis situation like now. Even for us, it's a crisis. I, I want to say that because our normal number of refugees or asylum seekers is like 14,000 people a year and now we have 43,000 within three months. So we feel like we are in a crisis, but like uh, Christoph said about Lublin, uh, I won't dare to say that we are in a crisis. But uh, on this um, sheet, you see that uh, also the federal centers of reception are really distributed throughout whole of Switzerland. It is not only one or two big camps with like a few thousand uh, places it is uh, really everywhere 
And when you see the numbers of those regions, like in the very east, Ostschweiz, it's in German, I'm sorry, um, we have, or this canton has to um, accommodate 700 people. Um, this is a fixed number on a legal base. This is not for the Ukrainian refugees, this is for an average uh, number of refugees of 20,000 refugees per year. Now it's a bit different, but you, I'll come to that point. So we have a, a I said, I talked about the distribution on a legal base, which is very important to say that it's a legal base. It is really in the law that, for example, my canton has to um, offer housing for about 6% of all the refugees that are coming. It doesn't matter if they are from all over the world or from the Ukraine. Six percent. We have to, you know, do everything for housing, schooling, integrating work, whatever. And we we can't discuss about that. We just have to do it because it's in the law. And the same thing happens one level further down. I'm on the on the cantonal level, the medium level, and the, the local community level also has those. Um, proportion raters on a legal base. They also they can't discuss about that. Every village has like has to take two people, seven people. It depends. It's a percentage. It depends on the number of people that are arriving. So I think that's uh, something. I thought that is uh, that is normal, but maybe it's not. So if uh, I'm, it's a bit complicated, I'm trying to explain it. If the people are arriving at the federal asylum center on the left, uh, they have all that paper uh, things done, the registration, the security check, uh, personal data verification and all that. That's probably the same in your countries as well. And uh, normally they shouldn't stay in those federal centers because they are quite of reserved for the normal asylum seekers. And we make a, a strong difference between those groups of people because uh, the Ukrainians, they have a fast track um, procedure quite similar to the, to the European Union um, privileges. And the normal asylum seekers, they have a longer procedure. It's more complicated and they have a lot less privileges actually so we have some people are talking about first and second class migration in our country but we're talking about ukraine um so if they if you if the people have uh, been registered at, at those uh, federal asylum centers they are transferred into the responsibility of the canton which you see on the right side and then still they don't they don't have any accommodation probably um sam is the state office of migration the federal level uh, they send the people to the canton and then the canton can decide you see it on the left side down they can decide how do we want to organize ourselves <coughs> my canton said okay we do all we put all to the to the local community level because it's such a big number, we can't handle it anyway in, in some bigger camps on the, on the cantonal level. It is just too fast and, uh, and school problems and medical problems, we can't handle it. Uh, not in that speed also. We just leave out that um, cantonal level and transfer the people directly to the com uh, community level, which is very special also in Switzerland. But as you see on the green thing, uh, we really have 26 different ways of doing it. And I, I can't say if ours is, 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 is the best or not. Let's talk about it in, in, in three years. I don't know. And the other thing which is special in, in, my play, uh, in, in Switzerland maybe is that um, the, the NGOs um, have been, uh, well, uh, they are integrated in the process. They started that uh, directly from the federal reception centers. Um, they used all those databases, private people who offered uh, houses and, and apartments and that. And they um, uh, tried to, to, to send the people directly into those places. 
it is a nice idea, but you will <laughs> see at the end that I'm not really persuaded of that idea because it brings it, it, it disturbs everything of our of our um, system with the with the uh, raters like which place has to take how many people and if the NGOs just send like a lot of people to the main city of Zurich it is absolutely overloaded and at the end we have a, a chaotic system so I love NGOs I'm I'm, I'm really I, I have been working for an NGO but in this context it's it's actually a bit difficult for our um, yeah, for our system. So going to the Canton St. Gallen, also, just if you look at the map, you see that all these points are different sort of camps. Most of them are for the norm normal asylum seekers, which are um, um, housed at the, at, the, at the cantonal level, mostly. And um, the one with the red, um, ah, Arrow is uh, the one for the Ukraine people. What I showed you in, in, in Kirchberg, it's uh, that, uh, that place with 200 uh, beds and the people just stay there for two or three days and then they have to move on and they are sent without free will of movement. They are just sent to some of those uh, small villages uh, anywhere. And not everybody is happy with that. Uh, uh, people who are coming from Kiev, for example, and they're quite surprised when they uh, find themselves in a very small village at the end. But uh, well, that's maybe one of the, one of the disadvantages. We come to that later. Um, OK, th this is the last complicated one. Uh, on the left side, you, you have the people, the private accommodation, the ones, the, the people that just arrive to their families and friends. And we have, we don't really have control over those people, which makes it actually quite difficult. Um, when you started, I went to my colleague and I said, like, do you know how many people are, are living in, in the Canton St. Gallen just in private houses? And he was like, we, we're not really sure. We don't know. I think it's about like 50%, but we have no idea which is really terrible for authorities, <laughs> which I represent. We want to know where the people are. We have to do all that paper stuff and, 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 and security checks and all that. And uh, it's difficult uh, for us if we don't know where the people are. So we really um, motivate every Ukrainian refugee to register over those uh, federal system I, I showed you these, uh, because then our, um, admission rate or distribution rate works. If they do what they want, it doesn't work. So we really try to, to get them registered, even if they don't have to, because they have uh, the freedom of, of movement with the visa solution, as you know. So, uh, and then, if, well, if the people have no place to stay, then they are sent directly to the, to the coordination office for, of municipalities and they, they have to uh, ensure housing. Um, the distribution um, is, as I said, ex, uh, again, a fixed rate and they go to the normal school, they go to normal doctors, they, they are really integrated in the normal system, which I think is an advantage of that system. Uh, the children are really together with all the other Swiss uh, children. It's a challenge for the schools, but they know they have to do it and they're doing it really, really well at the moment. So far, they are, they're really able to, to do it. And uh, the, the role of the administration of the canton level is also very important because we do all that administrations, permissions, finances, which is uh, really important for the municipalities. They, they don't have to do that because we are doing that. And also the federal um, government does it. Um, so if I... If I, this is my last uh, um, um, sheet. In green, I have like what, what, what helps to, to, why does it work, that system? What do I think is positive from a very subjective way? I'm sorry, but that's the fact. And the red things are like what, what is a bit difficult for us. So I think clear responsibilities help us. And they're really defined also in the law, which is very helpful. And they are the same responsibilities as in the normal refugee um, structures that helps. And also these fixed distribution rates, I would uh, be happy if we had them in the European Union, but okay, we have them here. 
uh, this is a sign of solidarity between all the villages and cities in Switzerland, which is, which is really one of our main, main thing. Still we are fighting and still we are discussing, but we have a legal base. And then something which is very important, we have a very good decision-making body. As an example, uh, I think Thursday is the day where the federal level has the meeting. So it is all the, really it's the, it's the government of Switzerland that has a meeting about Ukraine refugees on Thursday. Friday is our crisis management staff in St. Gallen. Again, it's the school, it's the health sector, it's the, the, the emergency sectors. Everybody who has to, who can take decision in our region is in this meeting. And the Monday is the local community level where they distribute all the informations coming from the uh, cantonal and the federal level. I think this is absolutely, uh, it's a great, a great way of, 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 of having that uh, communication and information flow. So fast and secure communication and also the database to know where are the people, who are the people, we have a good database. Uh, everybody can see uh, in this space where the people are. And then uh, for Christoph, I think a nice thing would be if the federal government bears the costs. Uh, the federal government pays about 1,200 euros, francs, Swiss francs per person per month for all the accommodation and schooling and, and everything health costs. And this is very clear and everybody knows it and you can rely on that money if you organize housing accommodation and all that in the community, you can really rely on that money, you don't have to be afraid that you are sitting on the cost at the end. What I also like is that uh, the system can grow and shrink rapidly and we don't have to build new structures because we nobody knows how long this crisis will hold on. And uh, that's why I'm very happy that we, we share that risk all together. We are not so Talia, happy. Th thank you very, uh, Tila, thank you very much for, for this fascinating presentation. Um, uh, before we move forward, I just have a quick follow-up question to you. What are the, do you have some legal tools that keep um, keep refugees in the, in the designated uh, location? Or what is the system in Poland right now? We have no system, and it happens that uh, that local governments would relocate refugees from some border towns to I don't know the seaside, and then the next day the refugees are uh, are arranging on their own the transport to the capital, which is obviously uh, um, overloaded with people. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. I can understand the problem. Uh, well, we have that data I told you about. We know how many refugees we should take here so and then we have like um i don't know that word in english actually the car thing that red green yellow the you know okay mm -hmm. so if you're like for the cantons and Gallen, we have to uh, accommodate like well, i don't know 1500 people i think if we have reached that point our uh, how, what is the name of the car well, it's a red, like the red light and nobody can be distributed in, in my region because we are sort of full. We have done our duty. If we are green, it's, it's very easy to send us people. I think that is very important. It's the federal government who controls, okay. who controls that system. But still the people, that's what I say, what I mean with they lose their freedom of movement. Yeah, they can't just go on and that's what happens but uh, nobody is really happy about that so they're really sent back i think and they, they we are quite okay. hard with those decisions there are two exceptions it's uh, it's family uh, connections close family it's just uh, the, the children and uh, and the, the parents that's the, that's the only the one reason the other reason is if somebody finds a work and uh, has a long way to travel there then we will change the region this is possible uh, and the third one is if 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 they are like um, yeah it's violence or some other reasons but it's very strict uh, to change your 
to change the place. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really very, very interesting. And now we will move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Eli Auslander from the University of York in the uh, in the United Kingdom, who will describe uh, how Germany um, actually dealt with uh, with the lo re location relocation of or organizing housing for refugees. And uh, could you tell us some more about the um, the Leverkusen model that you identified and in what way is it a good good practice? Certainly. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Eli Auslander. Like she said, I'm uh, with the University of York in the UK. Uh, I do have a presentation. So is, can I share it immediately or do I have to be made the co-host? Yeah. Yes, we'll, we'll make you a co-host and we can start sharing. Okay. Uh, it should be already. Yes, it should work. Okay, great. Let's, okay, let's, let's see. Uh, here we go. Okay, everyone can see it. Yes. Great. Uh, there. All right. So specifically, I'll be talking a little bit about the Leverkusen model, which is a uh, a town right next to Cologne, you know, on the border of France. Uh, but first I'll go a little bit into the general German context in 2015, 2016. Now, it's really important to recognize that since Germany is a federalist country by nature, there are a plurality of approaches all across the country. Uh, and I didn't want to put on the typical statistics that you always see. One and a half million refugees were registered in Germany between 2014, 2015, 2016. Uh, instead, I thought these three pictures really amplified the, the actual responses. So here you have Welcome to Germany, uh, what happened with uh, refugees coming into Germany when Angela Merkel suspended the Dublin regulation was that uh, there was a massive outpouring of volunteers and civil society organizations that were formed with refugees arriving uh, en masse in train stations in cities and across the country. Uh, here uh, in this picture, this is outside uh, La Gueso in Berlin, which was, which was importantly, the administration that was supposed to be re uh, registering refugees. Uh, there was a huge administrative failure because it was understaffed and underfunded for a good 10 years before this happened. So refugees were left outside, sleeping overnight outside La Gueso for several weeks on end, which then precipitated a lot of these civil society organizations helping refugees find places to live mostly in hostels, uh, any spare rooms that were found, people were, it was very ad hoc. There was no real organization to it. Uh, what the governments did do, a lot of them at the time, was they ended up using gyms, uh, school gyms, uh, other open spaces to create these uh, bed shelters, which as you can see, it's very simplified. It's just a place for refugees to stay, a place to have them centralized. Uh, so that they can be registered and then eventually have their cases heard. Now, obviously, this is not ideal, but this is what was done across a lot of Germany at the time. There was no, unfortunately, unified top-down sort of uh, guidance from the federal government in terms of housing. It was very much kind of spur of the moment because a lot of state governments and city governments especially were taken aback by Angela Merkel's sudden decision to say that the Dublin regulation no longer had precedence and that all refugees on the continent could be able to come to Germany and register there. So this is uh, Leverkusen, the city itself. Uh, uh, sorry for the German, obviously, I, I know not everyone speaks German here, uh, but the green, uh, these are standing uh, refugee accommodations. Uh, they are built to last a very long time. Uh, this one in the north is the largest one. Uh, the yellow ones are container uh, uh, accommodations. These have largely been closed already, but this is a, an older map, I think about uh, five years ago now. Yeah, five years ago. So these have been consolidated into the green one. Uh, and this one is the state itself, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, that they put uh, the refugees there and they get sorted out throughout the area. Uh, so as you can see, it's pretty much in every, uh, all of these districts that there is at least one, generally one, or there was one uh, container door, uh, I, I'll, I'll avoid speaking German, sorry, one accommodation that, that refugees would be sent to. A little bit on the Leverkusen model. Uh, this is 
something that is very truly unique in Germany, because keep in mind, Germany is a really recent addition to countries of migration. It wasn't until I believe 1998 that the immigration law was liberalized to allow more people to actually come to Germany, be citizens with Germany, within Germany, so on and so forth, even though they had this long experience of uh, immigrants coming in within the 60s and 70s from Turkey, Greece, and so on. So this started in 2002, uh, mostly because of the fallout from the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. You had a lot of refugees coming in from the Balkan area, and they were living in very shambolic conditions, in tents, in really poor container housing that were you know, poorly upkept, um, generally not well looked after. Uh, and it was actually civil society organizations, uh, Caritas and the Refugee Council, that came to the government and said that this needs to be fixed and we need to move refugees into housing, privatized housing. Uh, and they came with the idea that housing is the first real step to integration because the reasoning was housing comprises a mental health space, a physical health space, uh, an area where you can then jump into education if you need to go into education, uh, a, a way to actually access work, stable work, because when you have an address, it's far easier to actually find a job and stay in that job longer term. Uh, and so the government agreed skeptically, um, and they found that just by moving 80, 000, eight, sorry, 80 refugees from their accommodations into private housing, the city saved 76,000 euros, which of course is a bit of a case of have your cake and eat it too. Uh, so obviously the city viewed it from the, the, the standpoint of saving money while it also promoted integration for those civil society organizations. And this evolved into co-production of service delivery or collaborative governance, as we say in the public policy field. Uh, what this means is that there's direct coordination and collaboration in terms of generating policy and also in terms of enacting policy. So in every uh, refugee accommodation, there is a social worker employed by the city, as well as a member of Caritas or the Refugee Council overseeing the administration of the housing. Uh, there's also now, it's been going on for, for 20 years, so it's very well entrenched. And they have these active flow charts that they have in a lot of the uh, civil service offices describing what the communication lines are, who to contact for what, uh, and everything is then kind of centralized between the government and the uh, nonprofits. Just to give you a bit of a sense of what happened in 2015, because that was obviously a really big shock moment for Germany and uh, Leverkusen. Um, so before 2015, because of the Leverkusen model, Leverkusen closed all of its refugee accommodations. They didn't have any that were still remaining open. They still existed, but they weren't staffed. Uh, they were cleaned every so often, but no one was occupying them. So when uh, the refugee influx happened in 2015, they reopened all of those. They also had to do what a lot of the, the rest of Germany did, which was open gyms, uh, sports halls, so on and so forth, just to have places where refugees can stay. But what also happened with this was a surge of volunteers. And the volunteers suddenly constituted the foundational aspect of uh, the Leverkusen model because by using these volunteers and because uh, Germany's housing uh, market is very informal, you, the only way sometimes to find housing is by knowing someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who has a room available. Uh, by having these connections directly to volunteers, refugees were then able to find houses faster than if they had to go through adverts uh, in the newspaper or online. Uh, and with this, you also had the, the closure of these temporary spaces, which you know, well ahead of schedule, which was a testament to having this mass of volunteers that was organized centrally through the government and Caritas and the Refugee Council. This also prompted Leverkusen to develop a lot more of these uh, new accommodations. The accommodation style, although uh, you, know, you had these, previously there were tents and then there were the, the container housings, which are a bit shabby. They would maybe only last for about 10 years. They started investing in these longer lasting ones. I think they're prorated now for 50 or 70 years. Uh, and they're more of an apartment style rather than just individual rooms where you'd have to kind of share a kitchen or uh, share a, a toilet or something like that. 
Uh, and this also enabled for larger families to move into these accommodations. So they would be, I believe the largest one they have available is like three or four bedrooms in one unit. So a bit of an apartment style, uh, and but still not you know necessarily private, private housing. You're still surrounded by other refugees. Uh, but these accommodations, importantly, they also contain offices for the psychological help that refugees might need, social help. Uh, those are typically situated at the ground floor, so they're easy to access for everyone within the building. They also have um, handicapped uh, accessibility in the lower floors, of course. Um, and uh, this has en enabled refugees to basically find a way to have that sense of privacy and that uh, desire to you know, not necessarily feel at home immediately, but feel like they do have a path forward, which was the point of the Leverkusen model for the NGOs in the first place, develop a way for these refugees to really you know, feel more at home rather than feeling like they're being pushed to the side or that they are marginalized within Leverkusen. So here are just two examples of uh, the accommodations that we have for refugees here. Uh, this one is currently open. Uh, this one was under construction. This was the large one that I referred to where they're closing all the container accommodations throughout the city and then centralizing them uh, in this one. Um, and as you can see, they're very new, they're very modern, but obviously no one wants to live there for long because the first thing a refugee wants to do when they arrive in Germany generally, and the ones I've talked to have said this, is get, get, get back to normality, find a job, get their children into education if they have children, get into education themselves if they're you know, of that age, 18, 19, 20, um, uh, get to know Germans in general. You know, a lot, a lot of um, the Germans, uh, sorry, the refugees that I spoke to, the simplest thing they wanted to do was play football with Germans. So having these uh, embedded within communities, not only enabled contact points, but also they were sports fields and parks nearby so that the refugees could go over and be casual, socialize, and so on. Uh, and just to give you reference for uh, the people that I talked to, these are refugees obviously anonymized. Um, they said mostly that housing was obtained through friends and family and volunteers and NGOs. But the important thing to recognize here is that sometimes the refugees didn't differentiate between the volunteers from the NGOs and their friends. So they would use it interchangeably and it was actually kind of difficult for me to identify what they were saying because they would always say friend and volunteer, whatever. Uh, but it's very important to remember that these volunteers and uh, NGO workers were guided by both the government and by the NGOs coordinating between each other. And this is probably one of the more important aspects of how the, uh, the Leverkusen model is implemented because you have that direct connection, you have the direct communication. And when I spoke to the civil service members, they said it's basically always a game of sending emails to the various uh, NGOs, the NGO workers, asking if there's a volunteer available, if they don't have anyone, or if, there's, uh, if they have uh, someone who's an expert in this language that might be uh, a little not well known or very rare for this area because they have this big coordination game. Okay. So no, I can't even see my thing because of the, the, okay, there we go. So just generally, the model itself, it's supported by a very strong voluntary base, like I said. Uh, the, but not, even, not only that, not only just finding Germans who are volunteers, but also refugees themselves who then become volunteers and help out new refugees. And this is not only good because obviously these refugees will speak uh, the native language, they'll be able to guide refugees into uh, German society, but they'll be able to show them the ins and outs in, in a way that they can understand the ins and outs of getting simple things like a phone contract, uh, how to fill out proper forms, um, those very small bits and pieces of regular society that people who have lived there for a long time would take for granted. Uh, also, accommodations are situated in neighborhoods, and that is extremely important. As I said before, having, having accommodations situated directly within a in neighborhoods uh, promotes contact points. And you want refugees to be able to meet people who are native to the area and who actually care about helping refugees. That puts on a good face for the, for the refugees for the new country they're in, and it eases them into the language as well. Because you don't want someone who doesn't speak the native language 
finding people only who are, let's say, uh, stubbornly against refugees integrating. And there are plenty of those people, unfortunately. Uh, there's regular coordination between the, the stakeholders. So that's incredibly important. Like I said, because this has been entrenched for 20 years now, the Leverkusen model became the baseline against which refugee poly policy was made in Leverkusen. And because of the federalized structure of Germany, Leverkusen had that independence to kind of, you know, try something new and try different things uh, without having to adhere to, you know, any kind of government restrictions. The big thing there is that they allow refugees to find a place to live immediately as soon as they arrive. There's no waiting period to uh, to wait until there's a, an accommod there's a sorry an asylum decision, but refugees can move directly into private accommodations either with the help of Caritas, with the Refugee Council, the government itself, or volunteers. Uh, and, and even even though some uh, end up not getting a positive asylum decision, they can then appeal. Uh, but then they also start working, and they might end up getting a visa anyway because of the situation where they they're able to work. Uh, and continue contributing to Germany and, and earning a, a livelihood for themselves. Um, and uh, I, when I spoke to Caritas employees, they told me that there's maybe maximum a year spent in refugee accommodations, and that's kind of inevitable when it, when it comes to Germany. Uh, overall in Germany, not just in Leverkusen, but in all, all the major cities, there is a very big housing crunch. Housing markets are extremely tight. Uh, I believe in Leverkusen last I saw the saturation rate for housing, meaning the amount of people in, in housing versus the availability of housing was something like 97 or 95%. So it's extremely, extremely difficult to find a place to live. Uh, but because they have this active chain of people who are able to interact with refugees and help them find places to live, a year spent in refugee accommodations, you know, not by restriction, but just by housing availability is pretty good all things considered. Uh, the government also, the government along with Caritas also actively assess whether refugees can live on their own. And this really comes down to having some basic knowledge of how a housing contract works, uh, how to you know, simple things like how to sort re uh, recycling if they don't have a similar system where, they, where they're from, um, because you want them to be able to feel more welcome than not be alienated by the little differences. Uh, Let's see. And also, there's a good transparency uh, between the government and Caritas. There's actually a good example from one of the refugees I spoke to. Uh, in the accommodation where he had stayed, uh, one of the uh, employees from the NGO who was there uh, was mistreating some of the, 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 the uh, occupants. Uh, and essentially, this person was threatening uh, Kind of threatening or implying that they would lose their their asylum status if they complained about this person but the person that i talked to he signed a petition uh, he gave it to the government he contacted the government about it and then the government uh, actually came to the, the the accommodation they inspected it they saw that this person wasn't doing a very good job and they're being neglectful and abusive to the to the residents so that person was replaced by a new person so there, just with that example, we see that there is a good amount of transparency and, and accountability on the part of the government and the NGOs who operate these accommodations. Oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, and with that, uh, because this has been such an established policy in Leverkusen, uh, there's no limitation on how this is expanded into other policy areas. Uh, language courses are now available for people who arrive uh, the day of. Uh, there's expansion of interculturalism. There's cultural sens sensitivity training within the civil service, which is incredibly important, obviously. You want people who arrive on the first day to feel like they're welcome, as I said. Uh, there's a facilitation of cultural groups. Uh, there was the formation of a Kurdish cultural group when I arrived there, uh, which was the first in the area. Uh, and it obviously helped a lot of Kurdish uh, Syrians who were arriving at the time. And also something that was very um, specific to Leverkusen that was, you know, they were everywhere is called Sprout Cafes. Uh, what this is, is a, uh, uh, not saying it in German is kind of, a no, kind of weird. 
Uh, it's basically a meeting point hosted by an NGO where native Germans and refugees can go and meet. And it's a good informal way to learn German because these volunteers will help translate documents. They will uh, practice German with them. Uh, they'll help them with uh, education stuff. Um, and these are always situated basically right next to the refugee accommodations, the ones that are built within the neighborhoods themselves. And with that, you also have church groups that are within communities. They also develop these community areas where refugees can come and learn and discuss and learn simple everyday things like bus routes and uh, how to take the S-Bahn and all those things. Uh, and as you can see in these numbers here provided by the uh, Leverkusen Civil Service, uh, there's been a pretty constant turnover in terms of people moving out. Um, obviously 2020 with uh, the pandemic was uh, an aberration. Um, there's, it was inevitable that there would be restrictions and uh, very a lot of difficulties turning over beds and having open spaces, but there was very consistent turnover. People were moving out and uh, obviously more refugees were coming in, but it would be almost always replaced on an even scale. Uh, and this was always a transition, most importantly, into private apartments. Uh, and that's a very big deal because once they have private apartments, the refugees that I spoke to, they always say that they feel more at home, they feel relaxed. They're more able to concentrate on moving forward with their lives, which is of course, the most important aspect of being a refugee in a new country. Eli, thank you, thank you so much. We have to uh, we have to uh, finish here. We will uh, we want some time for for the discussion. Anyway, this is this is really fascinating, especially in terms of how the potential of volunteers can be used for providing more long term housing solution, which is something that. Uh, uh, we will. Uh, we still have ahead of us in in Poland, um, and now uh, I would like to invite uh, our last speaker, uh, Tomasz Pactwa, the director of the Office of Assistance and Social Projects of the City of Warsaw. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I know it's extremely busy right now in Warsaw, um, and um, and so I we really appreciate that you uh, found time uh, uh, to share the current uh, situation uh, in Warsaw. So can you can you tell us what what is the um, what are the, the the current numbers and what are the major challenges related to housing that Warsaw is currently struggling with? Uh, of course, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, sorry for being late. I had to relocate, if I may say, if I may use that word from one place to another, and there was a traffic jam. So, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. I haven't pre uh, prepared a presentation, so sorry, probably my uh, short speech would be a little bit chaos chaotic, uh, uh, but let me start. So first with the with the date when uh, uh, we um, mm, we had or have been uh, more than seven hundred thousand refugees within that period, but during the day we've got approximately three hundred thousand uh, refugees, and we've got really good um, data. So, for instance, yesterday we've got we had uh, two hundred ninety. Uh, and so on. So we got the every every day we received the the, the, the full information about the uh, the data, which is very good. So that crisis is a little bit different because we are full with data. Uh, obviously, that numbers came from the big data. For instance, from the uh, from the uh, sitcoms, uh, uh, we have only one hundred thousand approximately um, refugees already registered. They registered themselves in order to get id the uh, the uh, refugees are spread equally i would say within the city so we don't have any concentration uh, when it comes to the our support program integration program which we are building we are building that on uh, three pillars uh, one pillar is dedicated to the people who are staying in reception centers we don't have many of them uh, a city is responsible for 2,000 beds, an additional regional office, um, uh, approximately at the moment 7,000. Uh, when it comes to the people who are living in the city, 
Um, approximately 35% uh, are living in uh, houses or flats, uh, which belongs to, to their relatives or themselves. A huge number of people uh, who actually had accommodation, um, men who actually left, uh, left, uh, left Warsaw and Poland in order to get back to war and uh, their families get uh, actually replace them within within flats Appro approximately 23 percent are still living in in uh, friends uh, uh, flats in the city mm, four percent in our reception centers plus another four percent in hotels And uh, from from fifth percent of people in share, con uh, share uh, which were distributed by our system uh, or by the different uh, different uh, system, uh, which were created as a bottom up initiative. Uh, when it comes to the housing, last month from six to seven thousand uh, uh, flats has been rented. Has been rent. In other words, uh, this is uh, this is this is actually what we see as uh, as 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 flats who are shared and who are used by refugees. Uh, Eighty-one percent of refugees want to get job, and obviously I'm speaking about adults only. Declare that they want to have a job, and uh, nearly. Uh, one quarter of uh, adults uh, mm, has been already discussed with the employer, and uh, we may say that they have a job guaranteed. So far, uh, we employ 17,000 refugees. So this is just a report from the labor office. And uh, still uh, approximately a little bit less than 1,000 is looking for a job right now. I mean, as I said, we've got report, reports every day. When it comes to the, our system, I don't know because I was a little bit late, so I don't know if you are aware how the system, how the Polish system works. Anyway, uh, to make the story short, uh, refugees from Ukraine have full access to the labor market to the school, so educational system, including preschools, nursery, also full access to the healthcare system, which is very good. When it comes to the, our program, uh, program is divided, as I said, on three elements. That one, which is dedicated to people who are living in, in um, let's say, reception, uh, reception centers, are based on a few privilege. One is the courses for Polish, then the access to the labor market, psychological support, individual group, and a whole, a whole area of child protection. I don't want to speak a lot about that, but just we, we've got children who need to have an access to the Ukrainian system. We support them. Uh, some of them, nearly 20,000 children are attending to school, including preschool and nurseries. So we support them. And then there's a small group of children we have to protect every day. Thanks to the international organizations, uh, we, uh, we prepare a support program and the, uh, the NGOs cover some of the elements. Uh, the, pro the program is, uh, is, I would say, divided on horizontally. Uh, so each, 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 um, each uh, NGO has the, um, their own uh, space to cover. I don't want to speak about it a lot, but this is just part of our job. Now we concentrate uh, the, the, these these uh, these areas, the reception center uh, centers came up as a as a response on the crisis. So right now, from two weeks time, we are making that more stable. We employ people, exclu always exclude volunteers. I mean, we are not excluding them, but they excluding themselves because this system were really based on volunteers. Six thousand people were willing to help within that system. So thanks to our citizens, uh, we were able to maintain the crisis. But right now is the time for stabilization. 
um, uh, and so we are doing. We we've got um, six reception centers, but we're transforming it a little bit so that we would have uh, better uh, better conditions, excluding sport arenas and uh, temporary places. One place we leave right now the arena where people come and stay one day or a couple of days to make a decision what to do and then to be relocated but within the city we don't have regulations uh, when we can uh, distribute people to other cities we just ask them we make um, proposals uh, and then the buses come and then uh, they can go to Sweden gentlemen, just basically how the system works. Like 50 are about to leave the flat and they are at the moment making decision what to do. Uh, obviously we are not able to cover all the needs of people. So we will want to be able to uh, create uh, social houses so, so fast. Uh, uh, so uh, we rather concentrate on self-sufficient. So access to the labor market and perhaps then based on that People can make decision if they want to stay in Warsaw or move outside of Warsaw and work work in Warsaw, etc. So the huge uh, huge uh, uh, stress right now is on the access to the labor market. So apart from the reception centers, which are partly covered, uh, the main target is to cooperate to uh, to be as much access as possible when it comes to the labor office. Uh, and we've got still potential with that. And also we've got NGOs who are helping us with that. Uh, we are not, our decision is not to create any social housing combined in one place. It's like, I don't know, part of the city, part of the district. Our main idea is to distribute, to spread. We've got some social houses to be, re to be renovated. And this is our potential up to, we, we would be able to renovate 1,000 uh, flats within one year. So this is not uh, the fastest speed, but, um, but this is how it is. This is how it is, and this is how we uh, distribute information. There are some ideas from the international NGOs to support the um, social housing, for giving uh, subsidies. But this is not a solution in the city of Warsaw, where we simply are lack of uh, accommodations. So even if we distribute donations, the um, the, uh, the the rents fees would probably rise up. So uh, so as I said, we are building our support system. Apart from the fact that transportation is for free, that there is a whole system of subsidies. Uh, mm, uh, this is the third pillar. This what I mentioned is uh, is 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 the is the, the, the main uh, the main our activities the, I would say and what I, at the end I can say that we are we were a little bit afraid of what our citizens would say when we have such a uh, such a huge program of integration uh, but according to our last research last days more than eighty percent of our citizens really support us and uh, support. Uh, access to the um, schools, healthcare system, and everything, also transportation for free, which makes us believe that we are really doing a good job uh, with the support of our citizens who can do even more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomasz, uh, very much for your contribution. Thank you so much. We are happy I, I'm, I'm giving now floor to, to Marta, uh, who will moderate the discussion. So, so, uh, so as as you see, our our uh, discussion, our contributions from your guests were scheduled with the opening from Poland, then a few examples from other European countries and North American countries, so Canada, and then we moved back to Warsaw. So, as we have only twelve minutes for our discussion, I will just directly move to the questions. As you can see, and maybe as you follow the conversation going on on our chat, we see that this is a huge debate and I'm very grateful for it because we see that, uh, that you are interested in the issue of housing, of relocation, of the spatial policy in Poland and abroad. Uh, we have also some contributions and questions on uh, Facebook. 
just below our, uh, our streaming. So let me just pick up these questions that can be addressed now with the guests that are still with us because uh, two of them, so uh, Krzysztof and Jennifer uh, had to uh, leave us due to other commitments. So uh, I will start with the questions um, from Ngozi uh, from the University of uh, Nigeria, if I'm correct. Uh, the question to Tila. Tila, don't you think that confining refugees has a correlation with the inclusion? How will they access employment opportunities if they are forced to stay in one corner of a cantonment? So could you please briefly address this question? Well, if you find a job, you can change the region. That's a very easy question. If you can uh, uh, show that you can finance yourself by working, um, then it, it's not of much interest. Then you are integrated and then you don't need any social aid. You can find an own apartment. It's no problem anymore. Thank you. So now another question from uh, Professor um, Felicitas Hillman uh, from Germany. Uh, this was the question to uh, Krzysztof Stanowski, but, Tilek, but maybe other colleagues from Poland, including Tomasz, will be able to address it. So if the government is not financing, so the finance, financing support for, uh, for, uh, for refugees, who is doing so? Is all best based on sponsoring of the civil society? So maybe Tomasz, could you please uh, uh, try to answer the question? So what's going on with the financing of all the support that you are providing as the city, also the support provided by the uh, uh, average uh, Polish, and, but also by NGOs. What is the state of play, at least in Warsaw? Okay, when, when it comes to the subsidies from the government, um, there, is a, there is a regulation. So we receive some reimbursement. And also uh, citizens who actually decided to uh, keep the refugees home receive some reimbursement. Uh, approximately, it is 10 euro a day. So this is the reimbursement. It is not the, obviously it's not covering the cost of renting, but it it covers some of the expenses which are related with housing. So this this and it's and then citizens can apply. It's relatively easy, and they receive the reimbursement after a month. Um, and also we've got the international organization, but they don't cover the cost of the accommodation so far. They, they cover only the expenses related with the integrational programs, psychological support, and etc. So it's not that our government is not doing uh, the, the job, but obviously there is a lack of a system. Okay, uh, thank you, Tomasz. So now I will move to the question a bit different uh, that was picked up from these on, uh, on Facebook. So if I pronounce properly, Nana Adjoya from Ghana, uh, asks, in terms of integration and housing of refugees, I can see the emphasis is on Europe. Is there a likelihood for Africa to be considered? If no, what are the reasons? Thanks. And this question I am leaving to all of you. So who from our speakers would like to, to address this? Because I think that this is widely European topic to be raised about this, uh, let's say, selective approach sometimes to, to false migrants. Uh, so I can start. Okay, I, that's good. Thanks. Uh, just simply saying that uh, this is not the responsibility of cities, which I represent here, to uh, to accept uh, the refugees. This is a strictly government decision. And if the refugees from Africa, and they do, sometimes uh, are uh, are being. Uh, accepted by the uh, regulations, national regulations. They, if they come into Warsaw, for instance, they are fully covered with the integration program. Any other from our speakers would like to comment from your country's perspective, Tira or Eli? I can talk a little bit about Leverkusen, I suppose. Um, because Germany is so differentiated. Oh, sorry. I forgot about this. Because Germany is so differentiated, um, there's different approaches for every city and state. For example, Dresden is extremely restrictive, regardless of where refugees come from. Um, they don't allow refugees to leave accommodations until they have an asylum decision, whereas Leverkusen, they will allow refugees to leave accommodations immediately, regardless of where they're from. 
uh, even if the asylum decision hasn't gone through yet. Um, it's kind of hard to say uh, because with Germany, at least, they tend to give allowances to people who come from countries that have a very high acceptance rate. Uh, that used to be Syria. Of course, I think Syrians had a 95% acceptance rate for asylum. Uh, now that'll obviously be changed with for Ukrainians as well. That meant that Syrians at the time could get benefits, uh, integration benefits immediately from the federal government. Uh, but again, it, it's different at every city. You have the federal government umbrella, uh, and then you have cities with their own individual policies. Um, you know, as that pertains to Africa, it's, it's hard to say because there are a lot of European level treaties that uh, regard safe third countries. So if you pass through a safe th third country, then in Germany's case, likely they'll be deported back to that safe third country. Um, uh, I, I mean, that's at most, I can say that um, at the city level, at least in Leverkusen, there's no real care for country of origin as long as you get a place to live. That's what they care about. Thank you, Ilaitila. There is something you would like to add? If not, we'll move to another question. Uh, so there is one question that I think might be also uh, valuable at, uh, at the end, for the end of our meeting. Uh, once again, Ngozi uh, from Nigeria, and his question was addressed to Mr. Stanowski, Krzysztof, but I think we can also take this and put on the table. So, Mr. Stanowski, at the moment there is solidarity in hospitality and refugee response in Lublin, but with time fatigue will set in and inhabitants may become hostile. What will be the fate of the refugees in Lublin and other locations considering the activities of far-right nationalists in Kalish who refer to people who look different as enemies of Poland that must be expelled? Um, so that is the question. I think that this is a universal question. I know that today the focus is on Poland because we are receiving uh, the most of, uh, of uh, Ukrainian refugees, but this is always this, this issue. So how long we as the civil society, volunteers, local governments and uh, NGOs, we can provide support and what cost and when it, it comes this moment when we are simply uh, feeling that we are overloaded, that we need more support from, for example, the government. So we know that this is today the case in Poland. We know it well, because this is, we are already after the two months of receiving forced migrants and many experts, many practitioners, many researchers from Poland already say in media and in, uh, during the events like this one, that we can observe, for example, much lower level of in-kind uh, donations from uh, volunteers and from people living in big cities. So we see that we are becoming more and more tired, but does it mean that our approach will be hostile? I think that always there are cases of uh, xenophobia or racism, and it's not only the case of Poland and Polish cities, uh, still this empathy, I think, and a positive approach and huge support prevail. And that I'm, I'm very proud of Polish people in comparison to 2015. Uh, response to the, to the other refugee crisis, but uh, maybe you would like to comment on it uh, from the perspective of your cities and your countries. So Tila, maybe this time you can comment how how refugees sure. are received. Are these any are there any examples of hostility or this fatigue? Well, not against the Ukraine uh, refugees so far, but we see that um, like like. This week, uh, we tried to open a new center for, 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 for asylum seekers, and there were a lot of um, negative um, comments on that. Uh, opening an, a center for Ukraine refugees is not a problem at all. There's a lot of solidarity there, which is, which, which is very difficult for, for us professionals in the migration um, uh, area. I think it's important to uh, show the society that um, we are grateful for the solidarity, for the private, um, all the initiatives, but still it is a governmental job to do and we have the knowledge, we have the structures, it's a professional um, organization, we control the quality, we have an eye on the security, we, um, we're just managing things in a, in a professional and good and clear and transparent way and we don't just leave the people to to the people or to to themselves I think that for me that's a key showing and communicating that 
it's okay. We, we can do that. We can deal it. We can make it. It's not a huge problem. It, uh, it's just a necessity, but we are well organized and we will reach the, the goal. Yeah. Thank you, Gio. So I would just add to these three points. So this is all also about education. So how we are educating our society also about uh, access to public services, because as we know, uh, it's not about um, that there is no access to the services. The, the, the issue will be, for example, in Poland soon about schools, so that maybe Ukrainian children are uh, treated in a better way than Polish children. But this we will see, I think, just after the holidays, after the summer, summer break. Uh, labor market might be another uh, issue of concern, I think. Uh, and then all is about uh, narrative. So what is the narrative? What is the discourse, political and media discourse that is um, that is uh, created and implemented by the governments and at any level? So obviously the, the key role is played by the central government in case of Poland, but then it also matters how and what is communicated at this very local level where in fact this reception and integration uh, take place. So in, as, as far as I see in Poland, and I'm observing from the very beginning how different cities and towns are responding to the crisis, rather the message is positive and th there is no intention to create tension. Let's, let's put it in this way. Uh, so Eli, uh, Tomasz, anything to add at this very end of, of the meeting? Uh, yes, I think if I may start shortly, I simply don't agree with the statement that people are exhausted. Obviously, we see that the amounts, the, the, the non-nations dropping down, but it's normal situation. The same goes with the different groups, the different actions. This is just a normal situation. Let me present one more time the answer from our citizens. 86% fully support the access to the school, preschools and nurseries right now. Most of them, 76% uh, support the free communication. People really do understand. I know that professionals are a little bit exhausted perhaps, but let me just uh, uh, underline that our citizens support, fully support the access and accessibility uh, for uh, for our refugees, um, so we don't have to concentrate on the education right now. Perhaps in future, but that crisis is a little bit different. I, from 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 the beginning to till today, I haven't come across the aggression uh, and uh, and the negative effects or uh, I don't know events, something like that. Ne never, I would say never. Uh, so. So um, I think the, but perhaps professionals are a little bit exhausted, but our citizens sustain and support us. Thank, Thank you. you. So this is an example of positive message that should be that should be uh, spread. So how uh, how also uh, city hall representative approaches the issue. So what I like with numbers regarding simply the monitoring of the uh, social social uh, attitudes. So that's also very important. And uh, just adding to what you've said, uh, there is an interesting publication a report from this week by the um, Union of Polish Metropolises. Unfortunately, it's in Polish, so our colleagues from abroad cannot read it, maybe with the use of Google Translator. Uh, so it's about the municipal uh, hospitality. Um, and the research covers uh, these 12 cities I've mentioned at the very beginning that are members of the union, including uh, Białystok, Bydgosz, Gdańsk, Katowice, Krakow, Lublin, Łódź, Poznań, Rzeszów, Szczecin, Warsaw and Wrocław. So you, you, you may uh, have a look uh, about the developments, also the estimations concerning how many people uh, live so far or stay so far in these uh, cities. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that this is also a good example how quickly we are trying to collect as many data as possible regarding the population they need, but also the um, uh, the, the re reception capacities of different cities and, and towns. Uh, Eli, very last word from you. Yes, um, interestingly enough, uh, I can talk a little bit about the fatigue aspect. Uh, the civil service that I talked to in Leverkusen and in actually Berlin, where I did some also, also some research, they said that there was fatigue in volunteering just because 
you know, people have only so much time in their day. But there wasn't uh, an associated rise in xenophobia. And uh, actually, Leverkusen's government, they've been center left for the past 20 years. Um, and every election, the, the far right hasn't gotten any, any seats, uh, no, no real representation in the government. And in Berlin, in the recent election, they also moved further left instead of having more representation from the far right. Um, so I think the fatigue aspect, it's real for volunteers who they start with the passion of the immediate moment when the crisis begins and then things kind of fade out. But there still is a core of volunteers who are dedicated to spending their time with refugees and helping them integrate. But in terms of turning that into xenophobia, the people I've talked to in the civil service and in the respective governments, they haven't seen it. Okay, thank you. So now I think that we should uh, come to an end because it's four past four and uh, we have to really remember that we are very busy these days. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, for joining our, our, our third CMR webinar. Thank you to all the guests and we hope that we'll meet uh, in uh, one week with some of you at least at all, and also for our two, uh, two recent webinars. So just to summarize, uh, this meeting was devoted to only one of the components of these humanitarian and uh, reception and integration activities that are now uh, um, of a key importance in Poland during the humanitarian crisis in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there are three other meetings that are scheduled and just me let, let me just briefly tell you now uh, about the days and the topics. Obviously, the message will be spread. We are just now confirming the speakers. So next week, 6th of May, education, uh, children and students. 19th of May, labor market, best local practices. And 2nd of June, healthcare and social services. So we are still uh, on the table. We still want to discuss uh, the, the, the key topics regarding the reception and integration of, of post migrants and not only. Uh, and we hope that you will stay with us by the end of this uh, by, by the end of this service. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, Carolina, for co-coordination and thank you for uh, for your uh, attendance. Once again, many thanks to Embassy and to the union that they joined our uh, our service as as partners. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you.